Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're going to get started in just a minute, but thank you for joining all of us. Um, if you it could put in the chat, we were talking earlier about the winter weather, where you are, uh, where you are tuning in from, and um, if the weather is nicer than it is here in Chicago, because it's pretty, it's pretty cold and snowy here in Chicago. And I'd love to hope that some of you are in some place that is more enjoyable. Orlando, that's much better than Chicago as I hope. <laughs> Giuseppe, oh, nice to see you, Giuseppe. Rome, Italy, the weather is not too bad. That sounds lovely. Okay, well, we will get started and hope that those are, that are gonna join us will, will join in. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Welcome to the last week of Career Month. If you've been following along, we've, we've really enjoyed having you with us. Uh, my name is Natalie Orsley. I'm an assistant director here at UChicago working with the career development team. Um, and you are joining us during, what we like to call a fireside or a burner side chat um, on entrepreneurship on the menu with three amazing UChicago alumni whose creative careers have taken them from the campus classroom to bakeries and restaurants and blogs and bookshelves and beyond. Um, we're gonna to talk today about how you can make a career pivot and the ingredients for building a brand, all things, all food pun related. Um, so we really wanna thank you for joining us today. A quick introduction to our alumni panelists. So we're gonna hear more from them as we go. Um, Manish Malik is, started his career in the marketing, finance, and technology world. He has a track record for driving operational efficiencies in the automotive, finance, and legal industries, and he's worked for some pretty iconic U.S. companies. You may have heard of them, General Motors, J.P. Morgan Chase, Hewlett Packard. Um, before he, before, after he did that, he's now heading up operations at Rue Chicago and Bar Goa, um, two great restaurants in the city. One of Manish's biggest passions has been meeting new people and forming meaningful connections. Um, the hospitality industry lets him do just that every day. Um, he also wanted to change the perception of Indian cuisine by bringing a progressive and artful and vibrant Indian concept to Chicago. So we're really excited to hear more from him. Next, we have Lauren Shockey. Lauren is a New York City-based food writer and trained chef. Um, she is the author of two cookbooks, Hangover Helper, Delicious Cures from Around the World, and for Kitchens, which is her culinary memoir. Um, Lauren previously was the restaurant critic at The Village Voice, where she wrote weekly restaurant reviews and blog daily. Um, she's also freelanced for a lot of publications. You may have also heard of them. The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, Travel and Leisure, Bon Appetit, many more. Um, her work has been recognized by the Association of Food Journalists, and she herself has been a judge on multiple occasions um, for the International Association of Culinary Professionals, Professionals Awards. She's also worked as a freelance recipe developer and tester. Um, she's a graduate of the college here at UChicago and also holds a diploma in the classic culinary arts from the French Culinary Institute, um, which is now known as the International Culin Culinary Center, and a master's of arts in food from NYU. Um, Hadley Swee is a Brooklyn-based food stylist, pastry chef, and recipe developer, and a graduate of the college also. Um, she spent a gap year living with host families and attending high school in Japan, which resulted in a lifelong love of Japanese culture and prompted her to earn her degree here at UChicago in International Studies, as well as a certificate at the city's French Pastry School. She started her pastry band, Hadley Go Lucky, which has been featured in pop-ups throughout New York City and has also appeared as a guest chef on the Japanese Arts Foundation's Tokyo Ho House program. Um, Hadley recently published her book, um, Oisha Owe Show Shio. So Hadley will repronounce it in a better way when, when it comes up, um, which represents the culmination of Hadley's favorite pastry recipes inspired by both anime and her own experiences in Japan. Um, and we are really excited to have all three of these guests here today. And we are going to um, talk for a little bit now, but also um, have a Q&A session at the end if we have time. So if you have any questions for our panelists um, as they come up throughout, please put them in the chat or in the Q&A and we'll make sure that we get to them. But I want to start off with how these panelists got to the work that they're doing today. 
um, how they came up to this. And I would love to start with you, Lauren. Let me pull up the pictures you sent me so we could get a good view of the work that you do. Give me one second. Sorry, all too many tabs open at once and it is. <laughs> I can just start talking while, yeah, while you're perfect. getting up at the house. Um, so I'm a little bit different in that I actually wanted to be a food writer from the time that I was a senior in high school. Um, I had a teacher in high school who was really interested in food writing and he really shared that love of it with me and kind of introduced me into a, a lot of writers like Ruth Reichel, Jeffrey Steingarten, people who are kind of of that point in time. Um, and I thought, wow, like this is such a great career. Like I'd always loved writing. I you know, I took a lot of English classes and literature classes. And I thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe I wanna be a food writer. And I did like an independent study in high school with him. And so by the time I got to college, I kind of knew like, I wanna be a food writer. I wanna make this happen. Obviously I went to Chicago where there's not necessarily a practical, here's how to be a food writer course. Um, so I kind of just kept it on the back burner for a little bit. Um, I ended up being the, food critic for the Chicago Maroon my senior year though. Um, and then while I was in college, I started interning for Amanda Hesser at the New York Times. Um, and I actually got that gig just because I wrote her a fan letter and I made her cookies. I came to her house and I said, you know, I love your writing. I like want to be you, like, please let me intern for you. I'll work for you for free. I'll do whatever you want. Um, and somehow that charmed her enough to agree to take me on as an intern. Um, then once I graduated U Chicago, I graduated with a degree in French literature. Um, so again, not necessarily a, a practical terms of things since I knew I didn't want to be a French professor or anything like that. It was more just out of the love of, of literature again. Um, so I graduated, I moved back home to New York and I tried to get a food writing job. And at that time, you know, it was before the age of social media, before websites were really big. I really had wanted to work at a food magazine on the masthead. Um, you know, there are very few magazine jobs available for people starting out, so I couldn't find one at the time. So I ended up working in food PR. Um, I got a job at a PR agency that specialized in a lot of like consumer food products um, and ended up doing things like writing press releases, um, you know, kind of lower level and entry level stuff. Um, but I really wasn't enjoying that kind of work. So after doing that for a year, I said, well, really what I think can help credential me and really kind of get me to the next step is going to culinary school to have that experience of actually knowing what I'm talking about, working in kitchens, having that really culinary background to really provide me to the, to the next level. Um, so that's when I went to the French Culinary Institute. And then while I was there, you know, I was still reading a lot of food books and I was really interested in kind of like what it means to be a young chef. Um, you know, you learn so much in school, but then you go into a restaurant and it's actually like so different than, you know, you realize how much you were coddled in the culinary school kitchen. Um, but then you get into a restaurant and you're like, wow, I actually like don't know anything at all. Um, and I thought that was just like a really interesting experience. And I started thinking a little bit about books that, you know, there ha really hadn't been a book that talked about the young female culinary experience, what it's like to be a young female chef. So then after going to culinary school, I started working at WD-50, which was a molecular gastronomy restaurant here in New York. And again, I sort of started thinking, you know, could this be a book? You know, maybe I could make it something where I don't just work in this one kitchen, but maybe I work in four different kitchens around the world. And that became the basis for my first book, Four Kitchens. So it's a culinary memoir that talks about working at WD-50 in New York City. Um, you know, I worked at a restaurant called La Verde Call in Hanoi. I worked at a restaurant called Carmela Bistro in Tel Aviv. And then I worked at Saint Laurent, which is a two Michelin star restaurant in Paris. And it's really about those experiences, what life is like when you're in the kitchen, you know, the picking parsley, the, the mundane routine aspects, you know, before you get to be the executive chef. Um, so that was, that was, you know, how my first book came to be. Um, after that was finished, then I pretty much just started applying for other jobs and actually on Craigslist of all places was where the Village Voice job listing was. So I saw it on Craigslist, I applied, and then I ended up um, being the restaurant critic at the Village Voice for about a year and a half. Um, I ended up leaving there to freelance uh, to write for some other publications. I just, you know, as much as I thought I loved being a restaurant critic, I actually wanted to explore a little bit more and do other types of writing as well. So that's why I transitioned more into freelance. And then after freelancing for a while, you know, I started thinking about other books again, and I thought, you know, 
what would be like a fun book? I wanted something that was a little bit lighter, you know, a memoir you're writing about yourself. It's, you know, there's so much of you in it. I wanted something that was a little bit more purely cooking of a cookbook. And I was reading an article about South Korean um, food culture. And there was, they were saying how, you know, in South Korea, you know, there's this big culture of drinking, but you can go to the hangover soup restaurant the next morning. I thought the hangover soup restaurant, what's that? And actually in South Korea, there are restaurants that specialize in soups for when you're hungover the next morning and you go in, they pretty much only serve um, hangover soup. And I thought, wow, like that's so cool. I wonder what other people eat when they're hungover around the world. And that was just kind of this really fun, like, oh, that's, that's interesting. And I started thinking about, I started researching more, you know, here in New York City, the bacon, egg and cheese is the hangover classic, but what do they eat when they're hungover in Mexico? What do people eat when they're hungover in London? Um, and that was really sort of the basis for the next book, Hangover Helper. Um, so this one is different from the culinary memoir, which the, it, the culinary memoir did have recipes, but this one's purely a cookbook. Um, this one's illustrated as well. It's a very sort of gifty book, you know, good for the holidays, good for like a housewarming present. It's fun. You know, it's not too serious. Um, you know, some tips on how to avoid a hangover. Um, it's just kind of like fun, quirky recipes that yes, they're delicious when you're hungover, but, you know, could also be good for brunch or if you don't drink at all. Um, so something like a pickle brine Bloody Mary, and then, you know, it's got fun facts, um, you know, easy chilaquiles, um, things that, you know, are somewhat doable to make when you're hungover. Um, and this one was is a more collaborative process. You know, I worked a lot with the illustrator. I, I would develop the recipe. I would photograph it. She would illustrate it. We'd go back and forth on it. Um, so this is a really fun book to do. That's not to say the first book wasn't fun, but this one was like a very collaborative, fun process throughout. Um, and that's pretty much led me to where I am now. You know, I'm still freelancing. Um, now I'm thinking I might want to write a novel. So kind of still going in the book sense, but possibly something slightly away from cooking. Um, but I'm still kind of figuring that out at this point. Um, but that's pretty much my job in a nutshell. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. It's so interesting to hear sort of how you you had the path you followed to get to where you are today and it's really amazing um Manish you obviously have had a similarly uh kind of windy path you've done a lot of very different things can you walk us through how you how you've gotten to the point you are today as the you know op operating two really amazing restaurants here in Chicago yeah sure definitely thank you uh, you know what a great story Lauren uh mine is you know not planned at all uh, to get into the restaurant industry. I was very happily, uh, you know, working in the tech world, uh, always uh, considered myself to be a lifelong learner, uh, hence continued my education at U Chicago, you know, whether it was uh, taking classes at Booth School or uh, the financial math classes, which were driving me insane. So I switched to computer science. And then what I learned was, you know, um, uh, you got to keep challenging yourself and find your limits and try to expand and go beyond that. Never uh, did I ever think uh, I'll open a restaurant. Um, uh, my only uh, exposure to the restaurant was uh, at, at school early on in Ohio, uh, where I worked, you know, as a server, dishwasher, janitor, whatever. Um, and then... Uh, uh, fortunately, uh, because I was a tech uh, consultant most of my life, uh, I would uh, get the opportunity to travel all over the world uh, and dine in amazing restaurants, including uh, seeing the progression uh, in India. Uh, I, I was raised in Bombay, Mumbai now, um, and I would go back pretty much every year. I would travel, you know, different parts of the world multiple times a year, did that for 15 plus 20 plus years. And uh, I would come back to Chicago and uh, like, wow, you know, the Indian dining experience is still um, not elevated as it is moving back in India or even at the scale at which, you know, the restaurants are operating in the culinary capital uh, uh, Chicago. So I was like, okay, why not, you know, have some great food, great ambiance, uh, something that's sort of created in uh, Chicago for the uh, Indian community, as well as the extended uh, Chicago non-Indian community. Um, that was the vision. Uh, I never thought I will be operating full-time, uh, running the restaurant. 
uh, I thought, you know, uh, I was sold this amazing dream that I could open up a restaurant, someone will magically come and manage it, and everything will be fine and dandy, and I'll I'll go dine over there uh, um, and, you know, continue doing my tech uh, work. Uh, that dream shattered pretty quickly. As soon as I got into the launch mode, I was like, oh my God, this thing is pretty complex, you know. Um, when you go, I'm sure most of us, uh, including everyone on the panel, um, you know, don't realize when you go and dine in the restaurant, it's not easy that, uh, you know, everything magically happens and the food lands up on your table looking beautiful, delicious. Uh, and uh, that was my impression. Uh, so, you know, in some sense, uh, ignorance is bliss uh, <laughs> uh, after four years. But uh, to get to this point, it was pretty, uh, pretty challenging. Um, when I saw, when I opened... Uh, the number of challenges that presented itself were uh, were basically basically made me lead to the decision to quit my job and get into this full time, because otherwise I could see you know uh, me crash landing. So that is my story, uh, uh, you know, on how I landed up. It wasn't a big dream that I want to be a restauranter or I you know love restaurants and I want to open one. Um, you know, it was pretty much. I think it was around 2018 when I thought of it and then started working towards it and was able to launch it in 2019. Amazing, amazing. I love a, a, a love of called the culinary world has brought you to working into it, even if it's a bit more complex than you originally thought. Yes. I definitely think sometimes you go to restaurants and it's uh, it's hard to imagine that everyone, everyone always looks so calm and relaxed and like they have it handled and I'm sure it's absolute chaos in yes. the, in the back. Yes, and it's a 24 hour cycle. I mean, it never stops. Why? Because just imagine you have to plan ahead. Uh, there's a ton of ingredients that need to show up in your kitchen. Your kitchen needs to be staffed up with uh, the right uh, talent, the right chefs uh, who know how to, you know, uh, learn the recipes and follow the recipes and execute it consistently every day. Uh, then you need to make sure your HVAC and your plumbing works consistently every day there's no issues there and you're in front of the house staff you know the the restaurant managers kitchen managers uh, servers bartenders they all show up in time to execute so there's so many variables that go in and all of them have to work together in tandem for you to enjoy your dinner experience amazing i'm sure i don't know how many of you um, you know, already are aware of it. I'm sure some of you, but uh, me personally, I wasn't aware of all the complexities involved until I uh, opened the restaurant. That's amazing. Well, well, Hadley, we will round out our, you know, how you got here uh, conversation with you. Can you talk to us about how you, yeah, how your summer or your year in uh, Japan led you to the career you have now? Absolutely. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Uh, my name is Hadley Sweet. Um, I'm going to actually share a brief uh, photo deck with you all since my jobs actually all have been so visual. Um, so I'm going to quickly pull that up. Um, so I graduated in 2015 uh, with a degree in international studies. Um, I did spend a gap year in Saitama Prefecture in Japan before going to Chicago and just had the best exchange experience there living with host families and eating and cooking with host families. Um, so I really wholeheartedly pursued studying international relations and Japan um, while I was at Chicago. Um, part of my Chicago career, uh, I spent my uh, junior year at the Kyoto Consortium for Japanese Studies, which is located at Doshisha University in Kyoto. And that was such a great experience. It combined both Japanese language intensive courses, and, uh, uh, as well as a host family experience, as well as um, hyper specific classes pertaining to Japanese culture. And one of my very favorite classes was called Kyoto Artisans. Um, and as a culminating project for that class, Throughout, throughout the class, we got to go into the studios of these Kyoto artisans who have had the, the businesses in their family for hundreds and hundreds of years, uh, which is in and of itself an amazing thing to witness. Um, and as a final project, 
um, I decided to focus on wagashi, which are the Japanese confections typically eaten during tea ceremonies. Um, and as part of that, uh, I got to go take wagashi classes, uh, participate in tea ceremonies, and just really fell in love with the beauty and brevity of this type of sweet. It's like literally gone in two bites and you really learn to appreciate the, the fleeting beauty of it. Um, so I returned for my senior year at U Chicago, fueled by wagashi and still, still in love with Japan. Um, and as a fun project towards the end of the year, I actually learned about the Festival of the Arts or the FOTA Arts Grant. And I'm not quite sure if it's still happening or live and well on U Chicago campus, but it was a great experience for me. Um, I pitched an idea to make a series of wagashi that are inspired, were inspired by the U Chicago campus. Um, they're typically inspired by like poetry and nature and really can take on a lot of different uh, pop culture references even. Um, so I did a series of wagashi. Uh, there's one here. Um, this is uh, a phoenix seal wagashi meant to look like the little phoenix that you're not supposed to step on in the Reynolds Club. Um, also did a jelly that was inspired by the botany pond. So like a see-through jelly with a nerikiri um, white bean paste leaf on top. Um, and just got really, really had a great time being inspired by the campus surroundings. And with this project realized that I really wanted a creative career and wanted to blend it in some way with my, my love for Japan, but wasn't really sure how to yet. Um, so my next step after graduating in 2015 was going to the French pastry school, um, which was right by the Willis and Sears Tower. And this is a six month certificate program. And so unlike anything I had ever done before, I really didn't grow up um, cooking a lot with my family. We, we didn't really focus on that. Um, so I really felt like I needed someone to hold my hand. It was something I wanted to learn and didn't didn't have the confidence to just like apply for kitchen jobs without having those core skills. Um, it was a great experience. In my opinion, so difficult, it's just so physically draining on your body if you're not used to standing all day in the kitchen. Um, but a great sampling of courses, French breads, French candies, uh, petit four. On the bottom left, there are some chocolate sculptures we did as a class, which was an amazing experience. Um, got used to wearing a uniform. I'm not wearing the hat in these <laughs> pictures, but you have to wear a hat and get all that hair tucked up, which is also a culture shock for me. Um, but I highly recommend going to a pastry school or a culinary training program if you are interested in getting into the culinary arts without much experience. I think it was a, a great next step for me. Um, so, my next step after pastry school was moving to New York. Um, I had some friends here and knew it was just the place to be for food and a thriving food culture and ended up interning at a cake shop called City Cakes. Um, they not only are known for their cakes, like this sculptural cake on the bottom right, like a balloon animal, um, but they also have these half pound decadent cookies. Just the, the cookies can be a meal. They were my meal many times. Um, but really enjoyed working in this pastry kitchen. Um, and after interning there, ended up working with them in a recipe development capacity, which I was really excited about. Um, simultaneous to going to pastry school, I actually um, started a blog about my experience at pastry school and sort of that transition. And the team at City Cakes actually took notice of that and knew that I liked to develop new recipes and play around with flavors. And that's how this recipe development job came about. Um, so I can't highly recommend enough, like putting yourself out there and sharing your interests with others because you never know where that will lead. Um, one of the cookies I helped develop was this on the left, this matcha almond cookie, half pound, of course. And if you follow the account Food Baby, that's Food Baby underneath. <laughs> So I had to screen grab this image. Simultaneous to recipe developing at City Cakes, I really fell in love with the final stage of presenting a baked product, like sharing that final product with others. Um, 
be it on the blog or Instagram, getting people excited about that step of the process. Um, so be, before living in New York, I hadn't heard about food styling, uh, but actually was listening to a podcast called Cherry Bomb, which is for women in the culinary industry. Um, also a recommendation if you want to learn more. Um, and they were interviewing a food stylist who mentioned that she sometimes needs assistance. And my ears perked up. It, it was a moment. Um, I knew I had to reach out to this person and asked if she ever needed help. Um, and she did. So that, that was my first time um, I staged with them. Stage meaning uh, kind of like an internship, but a short term one day uh, work, working with them um, and started assisting um, other stylists that I would reach out to as a part time job while I was doing the recipe development work. And I really, my eyes were opened to this uh, food styling is you, you have to cook the food too most of the time. I really thought it would just be like doing fine details and design in front of the camera. And there is a large amount of that, um, but especially as an assistant, you need to be comfortable in the kitchen, cooking, preparing food. And as I was on the right, schlepping a lot of ingredients across the city so that they get to there from point A to B on time and in perfect condition. <laughs> Um, after that, I, I like to wear many hats. So I wanted to try one more, one more career before settling. Uh, I ended up working for about a year at a hospitality PR agency. Um, they represented clients like the restaurant inside of the Met Museum, um, Black Tap and their crazy shakes on the top left, um, Mandarin Oriental, Blue Ribbon Fried Chicken. And in this role, um, there was a little bit of food styling involved, but I did a lot of social media strategy, um, took a lot of photos for their social pages, and uh, also did a lot of influencer coordinating um, for launches. Um, and that lent itself to wanting more freedom um, from this cutthroat PR environment. And I started on the side both hosting classes and selling cookies under my brand name, Hadley Go Lucky, which I had not been selling things from, but had been building through my blog over the past uh, handful of years working in the culinary industry. Um, so I uh, started collaborating with local shops to do pop-ups and uh, classes. Um, and uh, for example, the bottom right image is an influencer event where I was tasked with creating uh, three new cheesecake flavors using cheese, like different cheeses. So there's a blue cheese cheesecake, uh, goat cheese cheesecake. And then we did a decorating class with this group of influencers for the French cheese board shop in New York. Um, right now, my career, this is, this is where I landed. I'm a freelance commercial food stylist full time. Um, I work on set collaborating with photographers and prop stylists. Um, with brands like Dos Toros, um, Pillsbury, and, and smaller ones too. I like to work with small, smaller growing brands, um, but really have found that I enjoyed this part of the process the most. And here are just a few examples of some of my past work. I feel like I really started to develop, to develop my own style um, while still maintaining uh, client visions and this is my most recent styling and writing project. Um, last year, my book, Oishi So, which means that looks delicious in Japanese, was published um, through the publisher Inside Editions. And this is my team on the right. We put together the book. Um, we were building the photo wall in the back. You can see how you can sort of piece together which chapters and images will go together based on colors and aesthetic and um, feel. And on the left, I just wanted to show you some behind the scenes pictures. Um, on the left, um, this is a pastry scene in the Miyazaki film, The Wind Rises. Um, if you haven't seen it, it's, uh, it involves airplanes. So we really wanted to pull in that thematic element into this shot. So I worked with the prop stylist to create these paper airplanes coming in towards the the triangular cakes uh, mimicking the, the shape. Um, it, we, we loved thinking through all of these shots and it's one of my favorite creative projects.
Um, and here are just a few more images from the cookbook that I really like and wanted to share. I was so excited to get this opportunity to blend my love for Japan and my pastry background. And um, yeah, uh, it was it was a very, very lucky and rewarding project. Amazing, amazing. Well, I'm going to come back to you actually because you brought up something that I um, I, I know a lot of our attendees are probably wondering, which is in the world of entrepreneurship, I think um, the idea of branding is really important. Um, oftentimes people will have the passion to, um, you know, to follow the, their dreams and the work they want to do and go off on their own and become these entrepreneurs for whatever their passion is. Um, but branding is a really important part of that to A, help yourself stand out amongst the rest and D, help to build, you know, your sort of portfolio and the work that you do. Um, can you talk about how you've how you've built your brand and what advice you have for others that are looking to you know start off and, and maybe it's culinary maybe it's something else but start off their own um, line of work and how they can build their own brands? Absolutely, um, I think as long as you maintain consistency, your people will come to you to a certain extent. Uh, I started with, as I mentioned, the blog and an Instagram account, Had We Go Lucky, and tried to post pretty consistently, like once a week, especially when I was starting out. And it was easy because it was things that I was grappling with anyway and wanted to share with not only my coolest friends, but anyone who would listen. Um, and I, I wanted to help other people that were in my similar shoes at the time. Um, so yeah, I, I think consistency is key. Um, and also allowing yourself wiggle room to evolve within that consistency. As you can see, I've tried a lot of different things, but I feel like all throughout my different jobs and career paths, um, I've maintained this just sense of like whimsical wonder with the beauty of food. And I feel like that really shines through in all of my work. Um, so really know why you're pursuing this culinary career and, and show it to the world is what my advice would be. Amazing. And Lauren, you obviously have this work now as a um, as a freelance writer and doing a lot of writing books, doing all this kind of stuff, um, which involves a lot of branding, right? You have to talk to these companies and say, you should let me write for you. Um, can you talk a little bit about how your experience in building your brand has gone and, and you know, kind of any advice you have for people? Sure. I feel like I probably have not done the best job of building my brand. Um, like Hadley said, you know, consistency, I think is really important. And then you know, I had a blog for a while, but then I was like, man, I'm blogging every day for work. I don't have time to blog on my own and, you know, posting. It's like now you have to post and then you have to do the reels. And you know, after the reels, then you have to, you know, like everyone else's posts. Um, so for me, I probably could have done a better job with a lot of the social branding element of it. Um, and that's actually something, you know, I wish I had done more of consistently and earlier on. Um, I think one thing is also, you know, finding your niche um, and really getting specific. So, you know, maybe you say, you know, oh, I want to, you know, be an expert on, you know, Italian food. You know, that's such a broad category, but, you know, maybe it could be, oh, I want to, you know, specialize in the food of Liguria because that's a little bit more like, okay, you can be the Liguria expert. So with me, you know, the way I've kind of, you know, both my books revolve this kind of international global aspect. So I'd say that's sort of where some branding comes in for me. And so now I've tried to brand myself as someone who really looks at global food culture, um, you know, through the lens of cooking and, you know, how these cultures differ and compare to each other. Um, in terms of like a personal brand, I think a lot of it's also just making connections, you know, especially when I was first starting out, you know, I was going to events like all the time I was meeting people, I would meet people for coffee. Um, you know, I would ask to pick their brain um, and just kind of, you know, getting your face out there. Um, you know, that's how you might meet someone. You say, oh, you know, I love your website. You know, are you looking for any freelancers? You know, I'm happy to write something for you. Um, you know, going to those networking type events, I think really helps because then you can kind of put a face to a name as well. Amazing. And Manish, you obviously have experience in branding on sort of the, the entire restaurant business side. Can you talk a little bit through um, what it's like building a brand for a restaurant? And like you said, in a huge culinary capital that is Chicago, but a place that was in desperate need of some updating on their um, relationship with Indian cuisine. Yeah, you know, um, go back to marketing 101 um, and try to go you know, create a list and um, and do your best uh, in each uh, activity. Um, 
you know, for example, you need to most importantly have a website, right? It's like a basic thing and just not an ordinary website, uh, a really good looking website, great logo and uh, great pictures, pictures of the space like you're seeing in my virtual uh, background for Bargoa. Um, the, you know, it has to catch people's attention to even, um, you know, get them interested in saying, okay, what is this? Um, the picture of the food, um, you know, doing the PR write-ups uh, and reaching out to the food editors uh, like like Lauren and, uh, you know, hiring PR agencies who will market uh, the brand, the restaurant on your behalf. Um, you know, I have never dabbled into the restaurant business. So it was an uphill challenge for us to figure things out and hope something works. So, you know, you talk about the chefs, you talk about the food, you talk about the restaurant, you have to make sure the location is great. Um, you know, website, Instagram, social media is huge. Uh, we have content rolling out every day almost, you know, new dishes or variation of the dishes or different pictures of the dishes, cocktails. Um, we have to uh, take it down to every day, you know, certain days of the week are slower than the others. So say, okay, what, what incentive can we give to guests so they can uh, consider coming to us? So uh, you, you just constantly think of uh, promoting marketing and try every trick in the book. Amazing. Yeah. Um, I think something that you all kind of touched on a couple times is the um, having to balance the world of your creative career and the entrepreneurship side with sort of the being the operational head as well. Um, so there's the fun of being able to develop these recipes and write these great cookbooks and, you know, take these beautiful, amazing pictures. Um, there's also a lot of like operations that come with being an entrepreneur and having to be in control of um, all of the maybe not so fun spreadsheets and business side of it. Um, Lauren, I'd love to start off with you on how do you balance, especially as a freelancer, because you're kind of making the point to a lot of people that you're going to do the creative work and, and some of the administrative work. Um, how do you find that balance between the two sides of your career? I mean, I think with the job of being a writer, you know, it's just me. So it's a little bit easier, you know, compared to running a restaurant where you've got, you know, front of house staff to manage, back of house staff to manage, you know, you've got your marketing team, you know, I'm really just a one woman show. So the, the operational side's not too bad for me. Um, you know, I'd say probably the one downside to being a food writer is that, you know, compared to a lot of other careers is not as lucrative. Um, you know, had I majored in econ at UChicago and gone off to, to work for a bank or something. Um, I think that is one thing that, you know, it is important to address just because, you know, it is creative and it is fulfilling, but definitely, you know, until you really get to the top, you're not going to be making a ton. And even at the top, it, the, the top of food writing world is still kind of the bottom of, you know, any sort of business econ job, unfortunately. No, sure. It makes, makes no sense. Um, Manish, you've obviously talked about this, right? The world of running a restaurant looked a lot prettier from the outside than necessarily when you started. How do you balance, yeah, the fun of, of creating these new recipes and creating the beautiful spaces that we see behind you, but also the, you know, the plumbing and the HVAC and the, the payroll and all of that? Yeah, you know, I, I have to do it. Uh, you know, another important thing um, is uh, hiring and retaining talent. Uh, this is such a transitory profession. Um, many people are there just to go through school or you know it's it's a side work or a passion work uh, that they might not be uh, with us permanently. So we have to constantly plan ahead uh, or some people might not be a good fit or they will violate some you know policy like not drinking at the job. you know it's it's basic. But we run into all these issues all the time. Um, initially, when you're new to it, uh, it's very intimidating. Uh, you know, you wake up with uh, butterflies in your stomach every day because there's always a new challenge that you've not faced. Uh, so the trick is to just say, okay, you know, I'm going to find a solution, keep a calm head, and do your best. Because that's all, honestly all you can do uh, in, in light of so many different variables that are not in your control. Um, so, yeah, you know, just uh, identify all the key uh, elements and uh, uh, stay on top of it. The good news is the number of variables don't change. 
you know, the, the, they are finite, they're not infinite. Um, so you kind of get familiar with the plumbing, the HVAC, the, 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 the talents, the chefs, the individuals, uh, the roles, the functions, they don't change, but people in those roles change. So you would kind of, you know, the more time you spend, the more time you try to think through um, uh, creating risk management strategies or problem solving, it gets better. Um, but you, you still have to be on top of it. You know, for example, if I don't get the payroll right, uh, um, people will start leaving. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you have to juggle all the balls and keep keep going. And build, you know, build the right team. So they help you. The team, how do we obviously saw the team behind you? We also have seen some of your, like the work, uh, you know, carrying the boxes of food around for the food stylist jobs and all that. How do you balance taking the creative world of, of creating your own cookbook and taking those beautiful pictures and also the operation side of, you know, having to to manage manage people and manage props and manage all this, this stuff? How do you, how do you balance both sides? Um, it's always evolving. One of the biggest barriers to entering the freelance food styling world um, for me was feeling like I had a voice to really follow up and get paid for certain things. Um, for, for example, as an assistant, um, I often wouldn't get paid until my boss, the stylist, had been paid. And often the client takes a while to get that money to the stylist. Um, so I as a stylist now, I like to pay my assistants right away because I know how much of a pain point that was for me when I was trying to get into the industry um, and have become a lot more vocal about following up with clients. Like, it, it's not rude to ask, where is my money? And I think that's something, that's a hard lesson I had to learn. Um, and another thing that you can do that I am um, just starting to pursue now is working with an agent who um, represents stylists and photographers who will sort of start taking over those business sides of um, your styling practice so that you can focus more on the, the fun stuff. Amazing, amazing. Um, we've also all talked about how you've all made some pivots in your career. Um, and you should think you've made the biggest one um, from tech, tech, the tech world to the restaurant world. Can you talk a little bit about, um, yeah, like how you made that pivot and what made you decide that that was the, that that was the point you wanted to be at? I think a lot of people may have an idea in their head that, you know, I love to pursue something that I'm passionate about and make a change, but the idea of making a change can be difficult. Um, so Manisha, I'd like to start with you talking about what was that point for you that you decided, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to go for this. Uh, great question. You, you know, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, I didn't plan to make this my career path. Uh, it was a passion project, uh, you know, assumed that I could hire a whole bunch of people uh, who will know what they're doing and they'll get magically get it done. Um, and clearly it was not the case. Uh, so what did help me, um, you know, which I didn't know at that point in time, uh, but it was, um, it got clearer, uh, especially during COVID and after that is all the work uh, experience and my education uh, that, you know, uh, I had accumulated for the last 20 years. So understanding, uh, you know, how to uh, uh, create processes, good processes uh, to problem solve, how to uh, do accounting, finance, importance of marketing, and more importantly, technology. You know, I, I spent so much time in the world automating a bunch of processes. Uh, all that really helped me uh, fix uh, the restaurant that you know I uh, I open uh, and uh, improve and grow. Uh, what people don't understand is that restaurant is not just about good food; it's about uh, the entire experience. And how do you get the experience? There's so many touch points. For example, we touched upon content, right? Uh, creating good content requires technology. You know, uh, uh, Adobe Illustrator, the logos. You need all that skill set. Uh, the point of sale system. So you, when you go to a restaurant place and order, the server's taking the order and punching it into a point of sale system. It has to get routed to the kitchen, to the right station in the kitchen, so that the cooks can start preparing and uh, put it in the pass so that the chef on the pass can review it, do the final garnishing, send it to the right table. Uh, so the food runner then comes in, takes that ticket and, you know, sees the ticket number, the dishes, and goes and delivers it to 
to the guests on the right table. So all this requires technology uh, and more. So for me, as I started to problem solve, it just came to light, oh my God, I know how to fix this. Okay, this is more of a supply chain problem for me. So, you know, the chefs look at it as a kitchen, um, the front of the house managers look at it as a front of the house serving process. For me, this is just a supply chain, front of the house needs to talk to the back of the house. You know, I treat all, I started looking at the table numbers as, you know, uh, PO boxes, routers, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, food runners and the server assistants, the servers, they're just routing packages from the kitchen to the right place at the right time. So once I started thinking um, in, in terms I was more familiar with, I was able to start making uh, better decisions and improve. So um, technology is inherent, uh, even the reservation systems, everything is technology in the restaurant now. Amazing, amazing. And Hadley, and you, you've kind of done a whole bunch of different careers all in the world that you've, that you've created for yourself. Um, yeah, how did you decide when it was time to move on to the next opportunity, the next pathway, um, and it was ready for a time for change? I feel like you just kind of feel it deep down. I, I think that a lot of you Chicago students and alumni, even if they're not in a creative field, are multi-potentialites, and they can really deep dive and be excited and passionate about uh, different, vastly different subjects. Um, even the classes we've taken at U Chicago um, range from like the psychology of extremism, which is so specific and the World's Fair on the U Chicago campus. And you can just get so excited about these different things. Um, it, it's something that I've been uh, exciting, excited about and struggling with because I feel like, I felt like at some point I should just decide and do one thing, but I've, come to terms with the fact that I, I like to have my hand in many different pots at the same time. Um, and I think the trick is finding the core skills that are the thread between all of the different things that you like doing. And um, even if your interests take you in a slightly different direction, still be flexing and utilizing those skills and marketing those skills. Amazing. And, and Laura, you've obviously also had some career pivots, including one that may be coming up with a, a novel idea um, in the works. So could you talk a little bit about how you knew it was time to move on? I know you said you started at the, you know, you're writing at the Village Voice for a year and a half and you thought, can I take this freelance and do this um, in other places on my own? How do you decide when it's time to, to make that pivot and move on to the next adventure? I mean, I think similar to what Hadley said is like, there comes a moment where you're doing your job day in and day out and you're like, this just isn't fun anymore. Like I'm not either, you know, creatively motivated anymore or, for me, you know, I didn't, I thought there was a little bit of a toxic work environment at the Village Voice. So that was a little bit more on the reason why I left. Um, but I think with anything, you know, the novel is something where I was like, oh, you know, I've always liked writing. Maybe I can challenge myself by doing a different kind of writing. Um, I think it's very, it's very much a decision that just kind of comes from the heart where you say, you know, I want to try something new. I'm kind of feeling in a rut of my day to day. Let's see how I can kind of get that spark again. Amazing, amazing. Well, I think as our final question, as we wrap up our event, we love to bring it back to the connection that we all have here, which is U Chicago. Um, and then I know Hadley, we were talking before about some particular U Chicago connects that you have, not just with the university, but here on this panel. Can you talk a little bit about how U Chicago has helped you to get to the career that you are in today? Absolutely. I think it's really the spirit of inquisitiveness and just the ability to be absorbed and deep dive into different very specific subjects that I've, I've really been able to channel that energy and continue to follow my heart and, um, take on jobs that really inspire me in that way and that's that's the biggest takeaway um, I also think that every U Chicago connection that I have is extremely creative and I, I love uh, meeting them for coffee and I, I just feel like there's a treasure trove of connections and I like to utilize that today. Amazing. Yeah, we're we're big here of on the uh on the idea of networking, especially here at U Chicago career programs. So using your network and you have a really easy small network here to join at U Chicago to start off with people who are who are available and, and willing to support you in your next venture. Um, Manish, how did you feel? I mean, you talked a bit about the classes you've taken here at U Chicago. Um, how do you feel as though your your education supported you into the work that you do today? Or have you kind of 
bucked that education and moved on to the next thing and said, you know, that was a good stepping stone. Uh, no, you know, I concur with what Hadley said. And, you know, uh, UChicago, you know, disciplines you and forces you to think, think hard about tough problems, right? Uh, and then not be fearful and try to um, uh, problem solve and get to the right solution. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it has had a lot of influence. You, you know, when you're taking classes, you wonder, oh, okay, how is this going to help me out? Um, uh, I think uh, there was one of uh, our uh, uh, financial math professors. He would be like, just trust your subconscious. You know, uh, the, the, trust the process. It's all going to come together. And, uh, you know, looking back, when you start so running into problems and you're like trying to solve them and some problems look unsurmountable and uh, there's so much fear, you have to make all, you know, all these decisions that impact um, your sales or your operations. Uh, all those, uh, you know, uh, disciplines and thought processes come to help you. Amazing, amazing. And Lauren, you obviously have come from, I think, one of the most U Chicago like uh, degrees with French literature and taken that and gone on to this career um, in great writing and doing all these amazing things. Um, how did that, how did your experience at U Chicago help you, even if you're not necessarily using the, the name of your degree every day? Well, I did have to speak French at the restaurant in, in France, so, so that helped. Um, I mean, I think definitely for sure being able to write clearly is such a U Chicago you know, key core skill, you know, you really cannot graduate without being able to write succinctly and clearly. And that's so much of what journalism really is, is, you know, how can you get to the point so that everyone understands what you're trying to say? Um, so for me, that was probably, you know, the biggest takeaway from my education, you know, being able to research as well. Um, you know, if I'm writing an article or writing a recipe, you know, get being able to dive into the cookbooks, learning at the history, looking at all the factors that you know, come into play, whether it's related to the food history or the food itself. Um, but I think even to just looking at, you know, when this, uh, when Hangover Helper came out, you know, I scoured the um, alumni directory and I looked up every single person who had put media and journalism in. And if there was any sort of newspaper connection, I just emailed them cold. Um, and then what, you know, the food editor at the St. Louis newspaper wrote back and he said, oh yeah, you're Chicago, that's great. I'll write something for sure. Um, so that was just like a nice connection to there. Amazing, amazing. Well, we love to hear everyone using their connections. That's what, what we're big advocates for. Um, and I wanted to say thank you all for joining us today. This has been a really excellent and educational um, talk. I've certainly both learned a lot and now I'm gonna go make myself some lunch because I've, I've gotten hungry from all of your conversations and pictures. Um, so thank you to our panelists and to everyone who joined us in the, in the group today. We're gonna continue career month with two more days of exciting events. Um, tomorrow, we're going to talk about the ethics of AI with a really great uh, panel on uh, data analytics and AI. And then we're going to round out our last day with an opportunity to flex what we talked about here, how important networking is with our networking night for our career month alumni um, with a really great keynote speaker. So we're excited for you all to join us. Thank you for being here. I'm going to throw a real quick plug in the chat for Wiser which is our networking um, platform that we use here at UChicago. So you can, like Lauren said, look up people who have um, similar career paths or career paths you wanna take advantage of um, and be able to connect and learn with them a little bit more. But thank you all for joining us today. Um, thank you, especially to our panelists and we will see you soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much, appreciate it.